got questions about batting. I've written down several and I'm hoping you guys have your questions ready because we can get them answered from Stephanie. She's got so much knowledge regarding batting. So. Hello, Hello Stephanie. <laughs> doing today i'm great how are you guys very good thank you for asking i was just telling everybody we're super excited about this segment because i know i have a lot of questions about batting so i'm hoping those questions come on in and you can help us get all of those answered <laughs> awesome awesome that's what we're here for right we want to get the yeah, that's questions right. answered and i think oftentimes what happens is people don't maybe don't even know what they don't know um because mm -hmm. i get a lot of questions where people say you know i've been quilting for 20 years, right? And at the end of a lecture, uh, because I do give this as a formal lecture, they'll say, I had no idea. I had no idea there were so many things. Or one of the most common things I hear is, now I know why that quilt didn't turn out exactly the way I wanted it to. <laughs> so I think it's important um, that we try to give as much information as possible. And uh, that's what we're here to do today. Well, I know when we spoke previously, you had said, you know, some people will have multiple pages worth of notes. So I am ready. <laughs> I've got my pen, I've got my awesome. paper. We are good to go. <laughs> awesome. So before we get into the questions, you want to tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Sure. So um, a little bit of background on the company. Um, the company company is, uh, the formal name is Hobbs Bonded Fibers, and we're what's known as a non-woven textiles firm. So we make lots of products. They're not made um, by weaving uh, input products like you would normally make fabric. Uh, we make them from loose components. We combine them in a variety of different processes, and we make things like uh, the lining that you see in your trunk of your car. We make items for first responders. Uh, we make uh, things for the equine industry, for the clothing industry. So lots Lots and lots of different products. Of course, I think the batting and the craft products are the most exciting. Uh, and that's a division that I am in charge of. So I'm the director of sales and marketing. I've been with Hobbs almost seven years and I came into the, the role 10 days before quilt market. So it was like a trial by fire. <laughs> they threw me in the deep end and said, will she learn everything there is to know about quilting and batting? And it's been a fantastic ride. Um, my previous career uh, is I worked in the paper crafting industry for many years. Um, I was also in the media for the paper crafting industry and wrote a, a monthly brand, branding column for a retailer magazine. And uh, prior to that, I worked in IT. Prior to that, I was a makeup artist. So it's been a long and winding road. And But I have to say that I think this is really the most exciting uh, in terms of the things that I've done in my career because it you just get to be surrounded by all these amazingly creative people, right? And wonderful people, like really genuine, kind, giving, loving, caring people. And it's just fantastic to see all the amazing things people make with our products. So that's the that's the informal bio. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I do have to ask also, do you do like quilting or crafting? Like what's your go-to? What makes your heart happy? Right. So um, I am a quilter, um, but I actually really like hand and quilting. I love EPP. So I've always got three or four EPP projects going on whenever I'm traveling. And that's usually where I have time to work on them. I am looking at a long arm machine. I just attended um, a show and got to sit down with a mid arm machine and a long arm machine. And oh man, <laughs> they're a lot of fun. So I'm already looking in my room and saying, where can I fit one of those things? But then I do a lot of sewing. I like making, you know, personal items, things I can give as gifts. I'm also a paper craft so I'm a card maker and a scrapbooker. I love doing mixed media and I'm hoping to kind of merge the mixed media and some of our products to create some really fun experiments. Um, and those are things that I will share either on our website or on our Instagram account. I'll be in the background here and I'll unmute myself to ask you some questions and I'll keep an eye on the comments. I know you said you have a lot of knowledge that you can make sure that you want to share that way too. Um, but if you want to just start out by explaining what is batting? And I'll let okay. you take it away. So for anybody who may be new to quilting and they may be thinking, okay, you know, why does batting really make a difference? So batting obviously is the middle layer. So you've got your top layer, which is generally where your piecing and your stitching is going to be. You've got your back layer and in between there is uh, batting and that's what makes it a quilt. So we make a variety of different products and they're all designed to give different effects to the quilt. Now it could be what the quilt looks like, it could be how it drapes, it could be how warm it is, it could be how heavy or light it is, it could be the way it makes your work 
um, really stand out. Um, so if you're making something like an art quilt, you have lots of tiny, tiny pieces. We have battings that are specifically made to make those stand out. If you're making a quilt with a lot of big piecing and you really want everything to have a lot of texture, kind of like the quilt behind me, um, then we have other battings that we would recommend for that. But we also know that quilters like to make lots of different projects. And especially if you've been quilting a long time and you've made a lot, a lot of quilts and how many more quilts can you make for your friends and your family? And maybe you want to branch out a little bit. So maybe you're making things for your home, right? You might be making things like table toppers or runners or placemats. You might be making pillows. Uh, you might be making lap quilts, you might be making wall hangings or something for the holidays, or maybe even a quilted coat or jacket. So really when we're talking about batting, it can be for any project. It's not just going to be for quilts. So anytime that I say quilt or I mention project, I'm meaning anything that you could make that might have batting in it. The other thing to keep in mind is that we also make things like pillow forms and we use our really nice quality uh, poly stuffing the same fiber that we use to make our poly down batting that's very very well known and loved we use that in making our pillows and we do make all those pillows in-house so they're actually the stuffing is blown in and then we hand sew all of those the great thing about them is they're super puffy and they really hold their shape and they're machine washable we also make stuffing so if you're a doll maker if you make amigurami and you like to stuff it with a really nice stuffing to fill it out if you're going to be making your own pillow forms or maybe you're a doll maker. Um, we make a variety of different stuffings that are fantastic for that as well. I think some of the most important things that I want to impart today is number one, there is no perfect batting. There is a batting that is going to be best for getting you the results you want this time for this project. And there may be trade-offs, right? There may be eight reasons that we say, oh, that's the perfect batting for this project. But there may be one goal that you have for that project that's very specific. And that may be the most important thing to you. And it may be that that batting is not going to give you that result or get, or get you to that goal. So we ask lots of questions. When we spend time with quilters and they're asking for help on batting, we always will ask a lot of questions. And we usually start with a five series of questions, but then it may go to 20 or 30 questions. What we're trying to do is to ascertain as much information as we can about your project and what your goals are so that we can make sure that we're recommending the best batting. And again, no perfect batting. We make all of our own products. We make them in Waco, Texas, and we've been doing that for 45 years this year. So we're very, very proud of that. That's pretty unusual in manufacturing anymore, um, especially in batting to make all of your own products. It's a way that we can control the quality of the products and gives us a chance to make a variety of different types of things so that you have lots to choose from when you're deciding what you're going to be making and how you want it to turn out. A few things that I think are really important. Number one, all of our battings are machine washable. Now, anytime that I say machine washable, there's a couple little things you need to know. Number one, that is always within a finished project. You never want to wash batting on its own. And here's why. Again, I mentioned earlier that we don't weave products. So we take loose components. Let's say like our 80-20, it'd be cotton and it'd be poly. And we're going to blend those together. And we want them to lock tight together. We want those fibers to hold up over time. Lots of use, leaven, maybe abuse, and washing of quilts. And so we want to make sure that that batting is going to hold tight together. Well, if you take a batting and you put it in a washing machine or you try to wash it on its own, this is what's happening. You're actually pulling those fibers apart and ruining the integrity of the batting. So you never want to pre-wash batting. Secondly, with every batting on the package, on our literature, on our website, you will always find a stitch guideline. There's a handy little chart that exists on our product page of our website. And one of the columns here is the maximum distance Oh, let's see, go over here. <laughs> Maximum distance between stitches. That is one of the most important things to pay attention to. And I will tell you in most audiences, only about 10% or 20% of the audience even knows that that recommendation exists. 
and or follows it. Here's why it's important. When we're developing a brand new batting, we are going to make what's called a wash test sample. So we're gonna make little mini quilts. We're gonna quilt them at different distances and then we're going to torture test them. We're gonna wash them and dry them over and over and over again. Then we are gonna take them apart and we're going to inspect the batting. If we have quilted the batting at four inches and at six inches, and we look at it and we say at four inches, it looks great. But at six inches, we're seeing a little bit of stress in the batting. We're seeing fibers pulling a little bit or maybe migrating a little bit. Um, then we know that six inches is too wide of a stitch guideline. And then we're going to recommend that you stitch the batting every four inches. And what that means is that when you have a quilt like this, you need to go four inches this way and four inches this way. Now, the more densely you quilt, of course, the stronger everything is going to be. But sometimes you want a quilt with a lot of open space. So we do make some battings that have a wider stitch distance. We have one that goes up to nine inches, one that goes to eight inches. Two of those are in that bundle today. So there, that's a chance for you to try some battings that give you a little wider stitch guideline, which number one indicates that they're super, super strong and also indicates that you've got more design options, right? That means that you've got more open space that you can leave open if that's your desire. So that stitch guideline is very, very important. If we tell you you should stitch the quilt every four inches and you stitch it every six or eight inches, you are risking the integrity of that quilt over time because it's not anchored in enough places for that particular combination of fibers, right? And that doesn't mean that a batting that has a four inch stitch guideline or even a three inch stitch guideline is not the same quality as something with an eight or nine inch stitch guideline. It just means that those fibers have different strengths and the way we make the batting makes one even stronger than the other one. So just important to keep that in mind. Another thing to know is that we have two different product lines. So if you notice on the banner behind me, there is Heirloom at the top, Tuscany at the bottom. Those are actually two separate product lines. And those product lines have some crossover products like cotton and wool, and they have some unique products. The primary difference between the two lines is in the way those are packaged. So the heirloom products are rolled very tightly by a machine. They're compressed, they're put into a pre-printed bag, and those go out in case lots. When we do the Tuscany products, we actually use the same base materials when the products are the same in both lines, but we're going to take those to another part of the plant. We're going to hand cut, hand fold and hand package them, and we leave some air in the bags. They're not tightly compressed. They're going to be very lightly folded. There's gonna be air in the bags and a pre-printed insert inside. So what is the difference? Well, the primary difference is with the heirloom products, you will see some wrinkling increasing in the batting with the Tuscany products you won't. Doesn't, again, mean that one is better than the other. It's just a feature of those. Also, the Tuscany products are not sold to big box stores or deep discounters. We only sell those to online resellers, sellers like the ones hosting today's program, or to uh, retail shops, right? Independent quilt retail shops. So those are the primary differences between those product lines. And again, there's some crossover and then there's some unique products. Another thing that's really important to think about is when you're thinking about the uh, end result, especially for things like quilts or clothing, there are many different things to consider, right? You've got things like the warmth or the thermal value. Is it gonna be cool? Is it gonna be warm? Is it gonna be both for all year round? Lots of different things to consider. You wanna consider finish and loft. You wanna consider the drapeability, right? And the washability. Some battings, even though all are machine washable, some battings have specific requirements around temperature and the cycle that you should put the washing machine on. And I can answer questions about those as we maybe talk about some individual products. So those are the really, I think the most important things that I wanted to make sure we get out there um, early. And if we have time at the end, we can talk a little bit about bearding as well, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what causes bearding and how you prevent it, if it happens to how to fix it. For anyone who doesn't know, bearding is when the batting comes up through the surface of the fabric. It'll either come up the top or the bottom. It's generally going to be in the stitch lines, generally not a happy moment for a quilter 
Um, and so we have uh, some ways to prevent that and a lot of advice we can give around that. Fabulous. We actually have a few questions coming in for you already. So let me read those off for you. Do you have a specialty batting for microwave use? We actually do not recommend any of our battings go in the microwave. Here's the thing on, on microwave use. Number one, everything you put in the microwave must be 100% cotton. So if you're going to make something like a potato bag or a bowl koozie, it does need to be 100% cotton. And that means the fabric the batting, the thread, and if you're going to put any kind of a little tag on it, make sure that that is also 100% cotton. The reason we don't recommend putting things like that in the microwave, so if you're making it like a bowl koozie, we recommend putting the bowl in the microwave, heating it up on its own, and then using some pot holders to drop it into your bowl koozie, using that when you're going to actually eat your soup or whatever you've made. The reason we don't recommend putting it into the microwave is because things can change in that fiber and you're not going to be able to see it, right? It's encased in fabric. So the more times you microwave it, the more chance of is that something is changing inside there in with that fiber. Now, you might put it in there a hundred times and it works great. The hundred and first time it catches on fire. That is always a risk. So you want to make sure that whatever you're using in the microwave, that it is made specifically for use in the microwave. And again, that every component of your project is 100% cotton. While we do have 100% cotton battings and they are 100% cotton fiber, we still don't recommend that they go into the microwave. And that's primarily because we're just concerned about safety. When you do put something in the microwave, never leave it unattended, never put it in for more than two minutes at a time, check it periodically. Um, and again, just always kind of stay there and keep an eye on it. Great information. Uh, we have a couple of questions about your facility in Waco. Do you give tours? Uh, we don't at this time. Um, and here's why. Um, I mentioned earlier that we make a lot of different products. We make products for all different industries. Some of those um, are exclusive products. They're things that we cannot talk about, that we cannot have anybody in the plant when we're producing those. Um, and there's also safety issues, right? The people that are in our plant that are running the machines, they have been trained on safety. They wear specialty goggles, et cetera. Um, and we always need to make sure that safety is our number one concern anytime somebody is in the plant. Even when I am in the office and I work in the front office and when I go into the plant, I have to have closed toed shoes, I have to have specialty goggles on, um, and I know the rules around where you can and can't go around the machinery. Um, and so we don't generally give tours um, because of the fact that it creates a lot of disruption in the process of producing and we're producing uh, two and three shifts all day long, right? So right now it's not possible. However, I would really like to host maybe one or two events a year. Um, we might coordinate those uh, with the silos, which is just down the road from us. Um, it's for any of you who are Chip and Joanna Gaines uh, fans, um, they are just down the street from us. We might coordinate a special event. And in that case, then we would make sure that we could have people go into the plant um, and we would have everything set up to accommodate visitors. Sign me up for that. I am a big fan of Chip and Joanna. <laughs> So I'll tell you, if, if people are interested in how batting is made, um, we did make a product for very high-end outerwear. It is made with buffalo fur. And the I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the program. There's a TV program. The crew came out of Canada, and it's called How It's Made. Um, that crew came into our plant, and they filmed us making that product a few years back. And if you go on YouTube and just type in How It's Made Buffalo or How It's Made Hobbs, you should be able to find those videos, and you'll be able to see the parts of the process that they were able to record. Some of those are, are confidential. We don't share them. Um, but it'll give you an idea of how batting is made, because how we make that clothing insulation is very similar. How It's Made is a fantastic show. That's actually one of my husband's favorites. He has watched every single one, every single season that they put out. Great, great show. <laughs> but anyway, to batting, uh, Marilyn here is asking, I just lost my question. There we go. How do you tell what the right side of the batting is? Oh, great question, Marilyn. That is something that I think um, people are very concerned about. And there are a lot of teachers out there who teach, you know, to, to flip the batting and look for the dimples or the, you know, or the, the little dots. You should never need to worry about that with Hobbs batting. All of our battings are exactly the same on both sides, except for one 
end product. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But the batting is made so that it goes through our process in both directions. Um, so the batting is the same on both sides. So you don't need to worry about the, the upside or the downside or the right side or the wrong side. The only product that is different is the heirloom natural with scrim. That is a 100% natural cotton with a layer of scrim. They are needle punched together that locks the fibers together. And that product has a different, you know, side on both sides. It's cotton on one side, it's the scrim on the other side. However, that needle punching process interlocks those fibers very well. So generally, if I hand somebody a sample of that product, they usually can't tell which side the scrim is on. But that's really the only product that is different on one side. And when people ask us, well, do you put the scrim up or down? Generally, we recommend that it go down, but you should experiment with it. That's what batting really is uh, all about, is you want to experiment with different battings and try them because you'll find some that you really love and some may not be your favorites. And, and that's why there's so many different battings uh, on the market. Can you elaborate a little bit on scrim? What is that? Yeah, let me, um, I actually have a sample here I can show you. So scrim is a stabilizing layer. If anybody's a garment sewer and you've used a stabilizer or an interfacing, it is going to look a lot like that. So this is the batting, right? Looks the same on both sides. However, it has this secret ingredient here and you have to kind of work at getting the two layers apart. So here is your scrim and here is your, your cotton, right? And they are needle punched together. These are really long, sharp needles that pounce in there thousands of times and it locks the fibers together. So this is what the scrim looks like. It is 100% polyester. It is incredibly strong. It's very, very sheer and very, very soft. So what is the benefit of the scrim? With a normal cotton, I would never pull on the batting like this because you would stretch it out of shape and very easily ruin it. With this batting, it doesn't happen, right? And that is because that scrim layer creates a web or a net around the cotton that holds it in place. Where would be an application that that would be beneficial? Um, so a few different things. If you're making something like a wall hanging, like the, the banner behind me, and you want the edges to stay really straight and squared up, that is a perfect batting for that. If you're going to be making something like a whole cloth quilt or an art quilt, um, again, and you want it very structured, that is a really great batting. For the whole cloth quilts, what's really nice, because that is just stitching and you're gonna be manipulating the quilt, moving it a lot. It's very easy to stretch out 100% cotton. If you take a, um, just like a cotton ball in your bathroom and you take the cotton and you pull on it, it is going to stretch out of shape. If you continue to pull on it, you can pull it apart. It's the same with cotton batting. So cotton batting is a little more delicate than other battings. And that applies to all cotton batting, not just our brand. If it's 100% cotton batting, you need to be a little delicate with it. So when you add that scrim layer, you are adding a layer of strength to it. So if you're making something like a whole cloth quilt that you're gonna manipulate a lot, this will keep that batting really nice and straight, keep it from stretching out and getting warped. The other thing is if you're gonna make a shaped quilt, right? So if you maybe you're making an art quilt or a quilt that has a scalloped edge or a curved edge, this will hold that shape really nicely. And then as I mentioned earlier, with some of the battings, they have a wider stitch guideline. That scrim uh, batting has an eight inch stitch guideline. That means that you can go eight inches apart on in your stitching, which gives you more design options. And it's a very, very strong batting. If you're making quilts for, for teens, um, or toddlers and you know they're going to be pulling on their quilts and maybe giving them a lot of love, maybe abusing them, um, even for quilts that are going to be used outside, this can be a really nice batting because it'll really, really hold up well. Wonderful, Stephanie. Uh, we've got a couple questions here. From One is from Sin. Um, what is the lightest batting to sleep with? I think it's important to distinguish between light and uh, cool or warm, right? So in terms of weight, in terms of light weight, I would say the wool and the poly are going to be the lightest weight, right? Cot cotton is the heaviest fiber. So if you want a really lightweight quilt, then you could go with poly or silk or wool. However, there is a big difference between the thermal value or the warmth of those quilts. So if you mean light in terms of cool, 
then you would want to stick with something like the silk or the wool. And oftentimes people say wool, but wool is warm. Well, wool is warm and silk can also be warm, but they also breathe. They're a natural fiber and they breathe. And so even here in very, very hot Texas, it's like 102 and 104 all week this week, um, we use wool and silk in our quilts because we want to make sure that those quilts can be used year round. We don't want to have to swap out our favorite quilts. So we use the wool and the silk. The poly is a really fantastic batting uh, for a lightweight quilt, but it is going to be warmer. It's a man-made fiber. It doesn't breathe the way the natural fibers do. So when your body temperature warms up, it is going to hold in the heat. So again, anytime somebody says light or heavy, um, we always want to make sure that we understand whether they're meaning in terms of weight or in terms of warmth. On that same vein, Jeff Becker is asking I, or saying, I like heavy quilts. Um, what batting would be best for me? So Jeff, if you want to throw it in the comment and clarify <laughs> after hearing Stephanie explain that, we can see what might be a good option for you. Yeah, and I would say if, if you're talking heavy in terms of weight, right? If those of us who grew up with those really heavy, cuddly quilts from grandma or, or mom, um, we'd like a really heavy quilt, something that kind of puts some weight on us, um, That then you want to go with cotton because cotton is going to be the heaviest fiber. We do make a cotton batting that is super, super thick, super fluffy. Let me show you an example of a little quilt. So this is a little quilt made with that. Um, you can see that it's super thick and it's a really nice heavyweight quilt. This little sample sits in our booth when we're at shows and people always put it on and kind of cuddle with it. This is the Tuscany Supreme Cotton. It's our thickest cotton. It's going to be the heaviest and you can even double that up to get a really nice heavy quilt. If somebody's trying to restore an old quilt and they want it to feel like it would have felt when it was made, that's the batting that we recommend. Awesome. Patty is asking, does using the batting with scrim elim eliminate the need for blocking? I would say it's pretty much going to eliminate that need. Um, I've not ever been asked that. So that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, I think that the key thing is it is that quilt is, again, not going to stretch out of shape because that stabilizing layer, just like when you use stabilizer interfacing and clothing, it holds its structure, right? So using something like that heirloom natural scrim will keep it really squared up. I, I've used it a couple times in smaller projects and I know quite a few people who use it in their whole cloth quilts and they do a lot of manipulating, a lot of stitching and they have no issue with that quilt getting out of shape. In fact, there's a beautiful one uh, that a quilter by the name of Chris Vieira, she goes by Quilter on the Run One, the number one. Um, online if you want to check out her work. She did a whole cloth quilt and showed it at AP, uh, AQS Paducah. And it was two layers of that heirloom natural scrim, really, really heavily quilted, whole cloth. So it was like a cream color and it had this sort of scallop wavy edge. That thing was so perfectly straight. Right. And that that she chose that batting specifically for that reason. Great information. Um, I want to back up a little bit to some of the terms that you've used. Can you clarify what needle punch means? Yeah. So if any of you have ever done needle felting, right, if you've taken wool roving and you've used those really long, sharp needles and you've poked them in and out of the of the wool roving, you know that that takes that roving and it kind of bonds it. Right. You can make little critters and all sorts of fun stuff with that. Well, we use that same process. In fact, the needles look very similar. They're on boards that are about this wide, tall as me, um, and there's thousands of them, right? And they go in, and when the batting is coming through on the, on the line, those needles go in and they punch over and over and over again. And what that's doing is it's locking those fibers together. So needle punching is something you'll see written in the descriptions of products. You'll see it on our packaging. Anytime that you see the term needle punching, that's what they're referring to. And it is commonly used in the making of that. Wonderful. How about loft? You see that all the time, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so loft is the puffiness or the thickness. So let's take a look at a couple examples here. So this is what we would refer to as low loft, right? This is Thermore. 
Um, and this is just a fantastic batting, has a lot of really great properties. Also one of the battings that we're putting in the giveaway. That is what's called a low loft or a thin batting. Then we have another polyester that is called poly down. This is what's called a high loft or puffy batting. So the low loft battings are best for when you're making things with a lot of tiny detail. So imagine you're making an art quilt and you have lots of tiny pieces, right? If you have a really puffy batting, which is meant to puff between the stitches, right? So here's your stitches in between my fingers and here's where it's going to puff. If these are really, really narrow and, it, and that batting really puffs, it may obscure some of your work. So you would want to use a lower loft batting for those kinds of projects. If you're making something for the table and you're gonna have food and drink around there, you wanna make sure that you're using a lower loft batting because if you have a really puffy batting and you put a tall stem glass on there, probably not gonna end up well. Now, conversely, if you want something to really pop or puff, like in the banner behind me, a little hard to tell maybe from here, but those K facet fabric strips, they are super puffy and they really pop off the background. Also, all of that texture that you can see, those straight lines that go around um, those colored strips and then in the middle where it's very heavily pebbled, that was achieved by having a very puffy batting. So in the case of this banner, it's actually two layers of batting. We put the silk on the back because it holds the shape and the structure and it helps that quilt to hang really, really nice and straight. And then we put polyester batting on the top and the polyester is meant to puff or give a lot of the texture. Why did we put those two together? Well, primarily because I fold that banner up and I hand carry it on every flight. I don't ever check that banner because that goes in the middle of our booth and I don't ever want to worry about it getting lost or damaged. So I always hand carry that with me. That means it needs to be lightweight so that I can carry it all day through airports and getting it to the hotel and to the show, etc. One thing I do want to mention, those two battings have a different shrink rate. And shrink rate is very, very important when you're going to be piecing or pairing battings and the project is going to be washed. So in this case, the silk batting does not shrink or, or does shrink three to five percent and the uh, poly batting does not shrink. So if we were going to wash this uh, quilt behind me, that would not be a good pairing because the batting that shrinks is going to pull in on the non-shrinking batting and that can twist or distort your quilt. So if you're taking your batting scraps and you're laying them side by side, you're running a zigzag stitch over them to connect them to make some new batting or to make for small projects, you want to make sure that the battings you're putting together have the same shrink rate and the same loft. Anytime that you're pairing battings, right? So you're taking two different types of batting, putting them together. That could be cotton wool with wool, could be 100% cotton with wool. It could be silken wool. You want to make sure that the shrink rate on both battings is the same if you're gonna wash it. Because again, if one batting shrinks and one batting doesn't, that batting that shrinks is going to pull in on the other batting and that could create twisting or distortion. That actually leads right into my next question. If I'm a fan of a crinkled antique look, what mm -hmm. batting would you recommend? Okay, so then you want to use a batting that is going to shrink, right? And if you pre-wash your fabric, that crinkling wrinkling is going to be even more prevalent. So let's say that you're using cotton fabric and you pre-wash the fabric and now you put a cotton batting inside your quilt. When you wash that quilt, the fabric's not going to shrink anymore. The batting is going to shrink three to five percent. It's going to pull in on that fabric, giving it that crinkled, wrinkled, traditional look. If you didn't want that, right, let's say that you want a really smooth finish. Let's say you're making a modern quilt or an art quilt. And part of what you want is a very, very smooth finish. If you're going to pre-wash your battings, you must use a non-shrinking batting, right? Because your, your fabric's no longer going to shrink when you wash your quilt. So you want to make sure that the batting you put in there is a non-shrinking batting, something that's going to stay nice and flat and smooth. And in our case, that would be any of our polyester battings. Those do not shrink. If you are not pre-washing your fabric and you put a shrinking batting with your cotton fabrics, they're both going to shrink shrink together, you'll have a little bit of wrinkling, crinkling, but not as much. So always important to be looking at that shrink rate. And again, 
that is something that is also on this chart that you can download from our website very very important chart it gives you lots of information that same information again is on every package of batting and that applies to anybody who makes batting we all put the shrink rate what the uh, fibers are that are inside the batting how far apart to stitch etc on the packaging and then generally on our websites our website for us is always the most up to date because it takes longer to update collateral and packaging and it's very expensive to do so so we'll generally always do our updates on the website first so if you've thrown away your bag and you're using your batting you can always go to the website to get the information fabulous um since you have that handy dandy reference sherry's asking does the cotton batting shrink and what's that shrink rate it does so all of our battings are going to shrink three to five percent the exception to that is is the Tuscany Supreme cotton, that really thick, soft, fluffy cotton. We don't heavily needle punch it. That means the fibers are a little bit looser. So that is gonna shrink more like four to 6% depending on how you quilt it. And then for polyester, they don't shrink at all. So the Thermore and the Poly Down and the Cloud Loft, those are three of our poly battings, they do not shrink at all. What I do want to point out is the more that you quilt something, the less it is going to shrink. And also you need to think about how you add warmth to a quilt. So um, if you've ever seen those puffer jackets, right, the puffer jackets generally will have either channel stitching or they'll have little squares or they'll have diamonds. And the reason those are put into those garments is to create pockets for air. And that air, again, generally those are going to be filled with down or with polyester that um, is going to hold in the heat. So when your body temperature warms up, it goes into those fibers and it gets locked into those pockets so when you make pockets in a quilt it's going to have more warmth than a quilt that is very very densely stitched awesome we have a couple of questions regarding the wool um nc boot is saying i'm allergic to wool too will it affect my skin okay couple things um if you are allergic to wool i would not handle the wool batting now our wool is 100% wool, meaning there's no other fiber blended into it. It's 100% wool. It is also a, a wool that is super washed. That super washing process cleans out the impurities, makes that wool fiber super clean and smooth and nice and soft and drapey, uh, but it also removes the lanolin. And the lanolin is often what people are allergic to or, or sensitive to. Again, if you're allergic to it, I would not handle it yourself. However, you could put it inside of a quilt. I know several educators that use nothing but our wool and they make quilts for their whole family and they have kids who um, are real sensitive or allergic to wool. They still have wool batting in their quilts because we're here in Texas. Again, I wouldn't recommend handling it if you are indeed allergic. If you're a little bit sensitive, you may find that you can handle that product because of the fact that the lanolin has been removed. Wonderful. Also, so um, what would be your recommendation for an all year round um, batting? Wool or silk. Wool or silk. <laughs> those, those right. two, yeah, and primarily because they're great in any climate right? We're really hot here right now. Our whole week is 102 to 104. Um, and I'm in Austin. The plant is in Waco. Then we also have, you know, Dallas and Houston on either end of us. And in Austin, it never used to be very humid. It was always pretty dry. But right now we seem to be getting a lot more humidity. Well, I don't want to sweat under my quilt and I tend to run hot anyway. So I like to use the wool and the silk because they're lightweight they're going to be super drapey and cuddly, but they are also going to breathe, right? They are they are actually antimicrobial fibers, meaning that when that fiber gets wet, it will wick and it um, does not mold or mildew, right? So the batting is not going to mold or mildew if the quilt gets wet. Um, they also dry more quickly. Your cotton fabric is going to take a lot longer to dry. So if I'm looking for something that I can use year round in any climate, the wool and the silk are going to be my choice. Now, I do want to mention that those two, in addition to the cotton wool, the Tuscany cotton wool, that is an 80-20 blend, 80% cotton, 20% wool. All three of those must be washed, again, once inside a project, cold water on a delicate cycle. You don't ever want to put hot water, high heat, or steam against any project made with those 
because the wool will very easily felt through the fabric with high heat or steam or hot water. So you wash them on a delicate cycle, cold water, and then you throw it in a dryer that's set to delicate or air fluff, or you can air dry those quilts. Perfect. This is not a question, but I just want to throw this out there because I completely agree. It's saying, really appreciate you, Stephanie, for all of this information. I've learned things about batting that I never knew. Thank you. So this is great. <laughs> That's awesome. I will tell you that is the absolute best comment, um, best compliment I can ever get. And that, that I'm very passionate about this. I do probably, I think in the last couple of years, I've done 250 of these lectures via Zoom. Um, and, and that's a more formal lecture, but I like doing this as well. This is really fun for me to get to do this and deliver this information in this format. So thank well, you. Well, we are very, very thankful for, for your your time and knowledge. We are really loving this. We're going to keep on going Kayla Quilts. That's Kayla now. She's going to be joining us too for this event. So hey Kayla. Um, awesome. She's saying, um, can I piece the scrim batting together and still get the benefits? I like to use all of my waste. Yes, yes. You can piece any of the batting. So for anybody who's not ever done that, number one, always keep your scraps, even if they're really small scraps. So those really, really tiny, little teeny tiny scraps, you can actually use those, wad them up, and you can use them as a little eraser to take the marks out of your quilt top. A, a quilter told me that tip and I tried it and it works great, especially works great with our 80-20. Um, anytime that you have larger scraps, all you're gonna do is you're gonna lay those two pieces side by side like this. You're gonna have a nice clean edge here and you're just gonna run a zigzag stitch over that. People have asked how, how wide do you make it? As long as it's catching both sides of the batting, that is plenty. There is a tape that you can buy that's called a batting tape. It's about this wide, it's a poly tape and you iron it in place. Two things to note about that. Number one, you wanna be very, very careful. You don't wanna put your, your you wanna use a pressing sheet, right? Don't put the sole plate of your iron on anything polyester um, because it will melt. Um, it will not catch on fire, but it will melt. Um, and that makes quite a mess on your iron. Second thing is when you're gonna put battings together like that, um, if you're going to use the tape, I don't recommend using it on really lofty battings because remember I said that these areas are the part that's supposed to puff, right? These are your stitch lines and this is the part that's supposed to puff. If you happen to have a piece of tape right here, when you stitch over it, it's not going to puff the same way the other areas are. And you may see a little bit of a flat spot in there. So I don't recommend using the tape on really puffy lofty battings, especially if you really want a lot of puff and texture, um, then I would use this exact stitch. And it holds together perfectly well because you're still gonna be using your stitch guideline, right? Everybody's gonna use that stitch guideline. So again, most of the time it's gonna be four inches, for some battings, it's up to eight or nine inches. BL is asking about that batting tape as well. Um, just a quick question. Does Hobbs have the batting tape or do you use a different brand? No, we do not make it. There are several different brands on the market. There is one called batting tape. That was the first one on the market. And there's several other companies that make them now. Um, they run around $10. You get a roll that's about this big and it'll last you quite a while. But I'm sure that you can find that. I, I think it's a, it's a great thing for, for stores to carry because some people are not as comfortable with that zigzag. But my personal preference is I use the zigzag stitch method and it works just fine. Yeah, we just peeked on our website. We do offer some from Bozel and then the awesome. zigzag method. I'm a big fan of that. I've done that multiple times. It's always nice when you're not throwing away those little pieces. So great, great. Um, Sherry's asking, can scrim be purchased by itself? It can be, be because it's basically going to be an interfacing or a um, like a stabilizer that you might be able to buy in your fabric store um, or at one of the big uh, craft stores. However, we don't sell it on its own. We buy it in bulk and it's applied to not just our batting. We apply it to other products as well that we make for other industries. Wonderful. Um, Bridget is asking, is there a batting that is better for using a domestic quilting machine like her Elna? So I would say the key thing when you're doing a domestic machine, especially if you're doing larger quilts, is you want to use a lower loft batting or a batting that easily compresses right? Because if you're trying to manipulate your quilt through a small throat space, um, you're going to need to 
really tighten that quilt down and move it around quite a bit. So when you're using a lower loft batting, something like the 100% cotton, our regular 100% cotton or the 80-20, or even that Thermore, that very thin poly, those are gonna compress down very nicely and you're gonna be able to manipulate those around. If you get a much like the thicker cotton might be a little bit more challenging with the domestic machine, um, but even the wool and the silk, I mean, the wool, even though it's puffy and the poly down, they push down as well. So if you press it as you're going through, you should not have any problem. We, we have lots of uh, very well-known quilters that only use domestic machines. Um, and it's amazing the quilts that they make. Uh, just absolutely stunning quilt work and, and ruler work that they do with a domestic machine. Wonderful. Do you have a specific needle that you recommend using when you're using your bedding? We don't have one specific needle, I will say. Um, this is this goes to that uh, talk that we do about bearding. It is very, very important that you start every project with a brand new needle. And I know I get a lot of pushback on this when I when I talk about this, but needles should be considered a component of your quilt, just like thread. So it's really, really important to understand the different types of needles that are available, uh, the sizes of those needles, and then how to properly pair them with the right thread right? Because different projects, depending on whether you want the thread to stand out or you want it to sort of fade in the background, you can use different weights, threads, different color threads, different fiber blends in the thread. You want to make sure that's paired to the correct needle. And I'm not a needle expert. I will tell you, uh, there is a gal by the name of Rhonda Pierce, who is the representative for Schmetz needles. She and I refer each other all the time. Anytime I do a batting lecture, I refer her. Anytime she does a needle lecture, she refers me. And that's because I think oftentimes the thread, the needle and the battings are really afterthoughts or things people are not thinking about up front. And you really should be because they will impact not only your quilting process, but the outcome that you have. If you're getting bearding, take your needle out and change it, put a new needle in. Oftentimes that will fix the problem. What happens when a needle starts to get dull is as it's going through the fabric, right? It, it's almost like a little fish hook. If it's got a little nick or a burr, it's dull down here, it'll grab batting and it'll either pull it out the top or it'll push it down the back. So starting with a new needle is the best way to ensure that you're not going to have any bearding issues, starting with the best quality fabric and batting as well. Another thing about needles is that you need to pay attention to the size because sometimes bearding happens when the needle going in is too big. And it's making too big of a hole and that allows the thread to grab the fiber in the batting and pull it up or push it out the back. So the size of the needle, the type of needle is really, really important. And I will tell you, there's nobody that gives more information about needles than Rhonda at Schmetz. But it's really important to learn that information because it'll make a big difference in the outcome of your quilt, your quilting process, and the longevity of the quilt. I just have to say, we absolutely love Rhonda. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is we have these ABC pocket guides and the luggage tags. She right. actually gave them to me while I was in your booth at QuiltCon. <laughs> Oh, like awesome. <laughs> no, yeah, she's been on with us a couple of times and she's fabulous. <laughs> yeah, she really is. And and we we like to partner. So she didn't have a booth at QuiltCon. And I said, oh, you got to come and, and share some information about needles. Um, because oftentimes what happens is when a quilt starts to beard, people automatically assume it's a batting issue. It's almost never a batting issue. It's usually because either they started with inexpensive fabric that has too loose of a weave, um, and it doesn't matter what batting you put behind that, it's not gonna have a tight enough weave in the fabric to hold the batting in place. Or again, if you're using a, a needle that's dull or a needle that's too big, or if you haven't paired your thread and your needle properly, right? And that's especially the case with a long arm machine. So if you have a, a needle that comes down on the long arm machine and it has this groove here where that thread is supposed to lay in there, if the, the thread is too large, it's not laying in the groove, it's laying on top of the groove. And when those two things go in and out of the fabric, that it is the needle is helping to make the hole and it is pulling the batting up 
right back and forth and it can pull it out of the fabric. So you want to make sure that you're pairing your needle and your thread properly. <laughs> Stephanie, I told you I'd be taking notes, but I stopped and I was just like listening, listening. So I'm also going to be <laughs> listening to this over again. I absolutely love it. So we are getting closer to the end here. Um, I do ask that, could you explain a little bit about the batting that's going to be in the giveaway? Because I wanted to hear about that thermore and the other specialty batting you mentioned. Yeah. So the thermore let me just hold up this little sample. So this is 100% polyester. This batting was originally designed for clothing and miniatures. It is incredibly strong. Again, I would never recommend doing this to your batting because you'll stretch it out of shape, but this batting will really hold up well to that. This has a nine inch stitch guideline, right? Meaning that you can go up to nine inches apart. That can be fantastic for things like t-shirt quilts where you may not want to stitch through the design in the t-shirt to anchor that block in place. It is also fantastic for any kind of inherently heavy quilt, t-shirt quilt, denim quilt, have a quilt that's gonna have a lot of heavy fabrics, lots of heavy piecing on it. This batting for a queen size weighs no more than your favorite uh, fabric scissors. So it's very, very lightweight, incredibly strong. It is also fantastic for things like wall hangings, right? It's gonna keep its structure, it's gonna stay very straight. Great for art quilts great for hand quilting. You can also use it for embroidery in the hoop, either by machine or hand. So if you're doing any kind of hand embroidery, I, I do embroidery and crocheting and other things as well. When I do embroidery, I put either the thermor, the silk or the wool behind that. But the thermor is a really nice thing to put in there because not only will it keep your fabric stretched really taut without that ring getting locked in there, um, it also hides a lot of sins. So if you're like me and the back of your uh, projects is maybe not as clean as it should be, your batting will hide that, right? It keeps it away from the fabric. And so it can be really nice for that. It is fantastic for making things like clothing, right? For, for jackets and coats, it's gonna give a little more structured feeling. Now, keep in mind again, 100% polyester, so it is gonna hold in the heat. Wonderful for a quilt when you want some warmth. Um, if somebody is has strength or dexterity issues, but they're always cold, this can be a really nice batting. So it's great for like a lap quilt. If you have somebody who's in a wheelchair or a, a walker and they want to have something they can put over themselves, it's really easy to move around, but it'll keep them warm. Thermore is fantastic for that. Uh, let's go to the scrim, the one we talked about earlier. So this is the natural cotton with scrim. Again, it's 100% cotton. Then with that scrim layer needle punched into it, it is still very, very soft and cuddly like cotton batting should be, but again, incredibly strong, not going to stretch out of shape. You should never do that to cotton batting because it'll just destroy it, right? It stretches out of shape. Once it goes out of shape, you can't use it. The great thing about this, again, it's great for any high use quilt, a quilt that may be getting a lot of use and abuse because it'll stay really nicely structured. It's wonderful for things for the table um, because it's nice and low loft. It's great for wall hangings. Um, and again, whole cloth quilts or any kind of shaped quilt, it'll really hold that shape really nicely. So it's a very, very strong batting. Both of those two are very strong. So the Tuscany Supreme cotton is our newest cotton. Um, that is the one that we made these uh, wash test samples with. It's super, super, super cuddly. One of the best things about that cotton, because we don't heavily needle punch it, which flattens and stiffens a cotton fiber, right? So if you've ever made a quilt and you've really heavily quilted it and it's made with cotton batting, you're gonna find it super stiff, right? One of the great things about this is that with this batting, even where it is very heavily pebbled here in the middle, very densely stitched, it is still super soft and pliable. It's not stiff at all. That is because of that super thick, fluffy cotton. We don't heavily needle punch it. Um, fantastic for old school heavy quilts, really great for redoing a quilt. If you're making things like pot holders or trivets or uh, table toppers where you're maybe gonna put some hot items on there, you can use that product. You would still want to put a heat reflected material in there right? You need something else besides just cotton. I would use two layers of that cotton, put a little heat reflective material. And that product is also fantastic when you recover chairs. So I recovered some dining room chairs, two thick layers of that super thick cotton batting. 
a layer of our poly batting over the top to create kind of a web or a net over the cotton to protect it. And those chairs are so super comfortable. So if you're doing any home decor projects, if you're going to try to recover couch cushions or make a poof or anything like that, you can use that really thick cotton batting with a layer of the poly over the top. Stephanie, thank you again for joining us. This was absolutely wonderful. As I mentioned, I was taking notes and I just stopped because I was so absorbed in what you were saying. Like so much information that I am gonna go back and we'll all watch it on our YouTube. So hopefully you can come back and join us again. Maybe we'll have Rhonda on with you too. <laughs> oh, that would be fun. Yeah, that would, that would be a lot of fun to, to do together. And thank you so much for having me. You guys have been great. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. If anybody does have any questions, um, you can always reach out to me at shackney at hobsbondedfibers.com. Or you can chat with me on Instagram. I'm on there every day. And uh, I love to field questions there and, and to chat and get to know what everybody's making. Love it. Well, we'll be following you on Instagram. <laughs> Thank right. you, Stephanie. Thank you. Have you. A good one. Bye.